rejected at Nazareth. This is what we talked about last week. Jesus left his hometown. And as he, as he leaves his hometown, he travels to Galilee. And there, throughout this region, uh, one of the people Jesus encounters is a man who, who has an impure spirit. And this is uh, Gospel of Luke, chapter 4 and 5, as we move through here. Uh, but this man with the impure spirit runs to Jesus and he says, Go away. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, a holy one of God. It's Luke chapter 5 and verse 34. And Jesus tells the man, the, the demon, be quiet and come out of him. And the man, uh, the, the demon comes out of the man without harming him. Those who saw were amazed at the power and at the authority of Jesus. As news about Jesus continues to spread throughout the surrounding region and area. And what we're doing in our series is we're following these interactions and these conversations with Jesus. As we just kind of move through the life and ministry of Jesus. And part of what we hope to do, what I hope to do through this series is I want to discover more about Jesus. I want to discover more about who he is and his purposes. And discovering more about Jesus, discovering more about who He is and His purposes, I hope that we draw closer to Him and that we begin to follow Him more closely. The first disciples, the first followers that Jesus calls are fishermen. And what do we learn from this interaction, this conversation that Jesus has with these fishermen on the Sea of Galilee? As crowds pressed, uh, pressed around to hear Jesus, to hear the word of God proclaimed, they, they stood by uh, Lake Gennesaret, and that is another word for the Sea of Galilee. Jesus sees these fishing boats, and he sees that one belongs to a man by the name of Simon, that's also Peter. And he asked Peter, if we can borrow your boat, can we push out a little ways from the shoreline? And as Jesus steps into the boat and they move out from the shoreline, he sits in the boat and begins to teach. And this is an area where many scholars understand it was near Capernaum. And Jesus is very likely in this vicinity of, of Capernaum. And scholars have noted how this particular area, the shoreline, would function and work somewhat like an amphitheater. In other words, there's higher cliffs. And when Jesus pushes off the shore to be in a boat, he doesn't have to elevate his voice so much. It would have been an area where a lot of people could gather and hear very clearly as Jesus was speaking from the water up onto the shoreline. And when Jesus concludes his teaching, he turns to Peter or Simon and he says, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Now, I would imagine being who we are and where we live, probably most of us have been out fishing at least once or twice in our lives. You may have even been out fishing all night before. I know that I have plenty of occasions in my life. And unfortunately, I've got to admit to you, there's been more than one time where I fished all night and didn't catch anything. Anybody ever have that experience? Anybody willing to admit they had that experience? But I can tell you this, on these fishing trips where we're out all night and we're fishing, uh, the last thing you want to do is to go fishing more, you know? Uh, when I get home from those trips, I want to, I am, I am exhausted, I'm tired, I'm wore out, frustrated, you know, things didn't quite go the way I wanted them to go on this particular trip. And, and the only thing I want to do is clean the boat, wash the motor, take a shower and get in bed. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. But that's what Peter and James and John are doing. They've been out fishing all night, and they're washing their nets. They're cleaning up, preparing for the next day. I can imagine that they're very exhausted. 
probably all they want to do at this point is to go get a bite to eat and rest. You know, professional fishermen, they've made their living fishing. They've supported their families by this trade and this craft of fishing. And they know the water better than anyone else. And they know today is not the day for one more cast. I've said that plenty, just one more cast. But they understand that's not this day. As they pull their boats in and begin to wash their nets. But nevertheless, at the word of Jesus, they push back into deeper water to throw their nets over the side into the waters that has not produced a catch all night. But this one more cast made a difference. The nets fill so much so that they begin to break. And Peter calls down for his partners to come and help. And they come with their boats, and both of the boats begin to overflow with fish, so much so that they begin to sink. And a catch like this can only mean one thing. You know, given the the relatively small region around the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, Peter would have been aware of Jesus. He would have been aware of his ministry. He would have been probably aware of some of the miracles or at least heard the stories of this rabbi who was performing these miracles. He He could have perhaps even witnessed one of these miracles himself. But what was running through his mind? What was stirring in Peter's heart as he made this one last cast? You know, we don't know. But what we do know is that Peter was sure of one thing. This catch could only mean one thing. Lord, Messiah. For Peter, the messianic claims of Jesus were confirmed. This is God's anointed. And what's clear to Peter in this moment is his failure. What's clear to Peter is is his sin. He considered himself unworthy to be in the presence of God's anointed. And fear grips Peter as he falls to his knees before Jesus. Peter gets it. You see, we can't pretend to be something we're not when we stand before Jesus. We can't pretend to be someone we're not in the presence of the Lord. It's like Ezekiel, who fell face down when he heard the voice of the Lord. Or Moses and Aaron at the tent of meetings when they fell on their faces as the glory of the Lord appeared to them. You see, Peter understands there's no pretending before Jesus. There's no pretending before the Lord. What does Jesus do? Jesus calms their fear. You know, I've often wondered what it would be like to meet Jesus. But more and more in the Bible, what we see when people meet the presence of the Lord, they're gripped in fear and they fall on their face. But notice what Jesus does. He he calms their fear. He said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to fish for people. You're going to be fishermen of men. And they bring their boats to shore. They follow Jesus. 
Now, here's where I want us to try something in your notes, in your handout. You've got a QR code, and I think it's labeled there, Ancient Galilean Boat. And if you're able, I want you to scan that QR code, and I want you to go to the website and check it out. Uh, and if your neighbor's not able to do that, help them out. Show them this real quick. But this is very interesting. This is a first century boat that was found in 1986. Now, to me, that doesn't seem so long ago, but as we look back, that's been quite a few years ago. But this is a, a, a boat that they found on the Sea of Galilee that was definitely the time period of Jesus. Now, was it the boat Jesus was on? More than likely not, but it is the type of boat that Jesus would have been on. And I think it's just amazing that we have this discovery. Uh, what happened was during a drought, the waters receded on the Sea of Galilee. Part of this boat became exposed, and they were able to excavate it. It's just amazing to me that we have preserved this history. And, and I wanted to show you that because sometimes when we think fishing boat and being where we are, we're kind of picturing a shrimp boat or something like that, maybe. Uh, but no, this would have been, and for those who are able to see it, uh, would have been more like the boat we're talking about here. So Jesus says, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be fishers of men. You will fish for people. And they bring their boats to the shore, and these fishermen follow Jesus. And notice what Jesus does not do here as they begin to follow him. Jesus doesn't condemn them. Right? I mean, our story, this account's kind of focusing on Peter, but don't forget, James or John are here also. And Jesus doesn't condemn them. He doesn't tell them, yeah, you're right, you're unworthy to follow me. He doesn't point to their past doubts. He doesn't point to their failures. He doesn't point to their unfaithfulness. He doesn't even point to their fears. But what Jesus does do is give them a new vocation. And what they do, without little idea of, or understanding of what this new vocation is going to look like, they set out to follow Jesus. They lay down their nets, and they follow him. I want us to think about this for a minute. And what does this mean? What does this kind of look like for us today? A couple of quick points that I believe we can understand just from looking and examining this text. Following Jesus today, there's, there's no pretending. You see, we can't pretend to be someone we're not before the Lord. We can't pretend to be someone other than who we are when we come to Jesus. The Apostle Paul records in Romans chapter 8 that Jesus knows our hearts. He knows us. So there's no point in pretending before Jesus. But in knowing us, Jesus doesn't want us to run and hide. It's just like in the garden. God didn't want Adam and Eve to go run and hide. He said, where are you at? And he extended grace and mercy to Adam and Eve. And that's the desire of Jesus. Not that we run and hide from him, but that he can restore and heal. And that's what he does. Following Jesus means that we're going to need to step outside of the boat. Now, I've got to be honest, that's the title of a book. But it's a good title, and I've got to use it. <laughs> it was about this event, stepping outside of the boat. Following Jesus means we're going to need to step outside of the boat. Peter, James, and John, they knew this life of fishing. That's what they did. That's how they supported their families. It was a lifestyle that supported the community that they lived in. But following Jesus meant that they were going to have to step outside of their comfort zone. And following Jesus means we may not always know the path forward. 
Peter, James, and John, as they left to follow Jesus, they didn't know everything that was going to happen in the next few months or days. It means that we need to stop trusting our nets and start trusting Jesus. And for me, personally, this has been the, one of the most challenging things about following Jesus. Because I like to have a plan. In fact, Brenda will tell you, I usually will not walk out of the house if I don't have a plan together. Even if it's to eat dinner, I'm not going to go sit in the car and figure out where we're eating dinner. We've got to have a plan before we step out of the house. I like a plan. I want to know what the next step is. How are we going to get there? How, how, where are we going to go? But I'm probably worse than you because it's not just that I want a plan. I want a backup plan in case the first plan falls apart. But here's the thing about following Jesus. We may not always know the next step forward. We may not always know what the plan is. Or where we're headed. Ultimately, yes, we know we're, <laughs> we're going to be with Him. But I may not know tomorrow. The thing about following Jesus, it's a matter of putting our trust in His wisdom and His direction. Proverbs chapter 3 and verses 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him, and He will make your path straight. For me, this is a challenging verse. It's a challenging proverb. Because I like to trust in my understanding. But following Jesus means we're going to lean on His understanding and submit to Him wherever we may step forward to with him following jesus means that we have a renewed vocation a renewed job now let me be clear i'm not telling you all to go quit your jobs and get out of retirement and do all that that's not what i'm saying it, it doesn't mean that we need to uh, all quit and go be missionaries or bible teachers or any of that. that's not what i'm saying but we need to understand that following Jesus means we have a new vocation. and We need to be who we're called to be. We may be carpenters, we may be accountants, fishermen, project managers, homemakers, you name it. But this isn't who you are. And this is a big barrier where we live and the culture we live in. Typically, we define ourselves by what we do. If you meet somebody new, what's one of the first questions you ask them? What do you do? Oh, well, let me tell you what I do. Well, I work in banking, or I, I am a homemaker, or here you go. And typically, that's how we define ourselves, by what we do. But what we do as a Christian does not determine who we are. What we do as a Christian does not determine who we are. Following Jesus means that we are Christians. We are Christ followers. And as those who follow Christ, we have a renewed vocation. And this vocation includes telling others about the good news of Jesus. It includes sharing God's abundance, His resources, His kingdom with others. Just like these first fishermen did. Following Jesus is understanding who you are. And we may do uh, any number of jobs to support our families and to support one another, but it's not defining who you are. Following Jesus defines who you are. And it defines your purpose. The Apostle Paul, he saw his purpose 
as being Christ's ambassador. He was given to this ministry of reconciliation. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul records, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. A new creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us this ministry of reconciliation. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. He's committed to us this message of reconciliation. Who we are is not defined by what we do, but who Christ is. And as those who follow Christ, we've been given a new vocation, We share in this ministry of reconciliation as the Apostle Paul did. And following Christ means we recognize our vocation where we go to work and what we do. So just one question as we close today and consider these lessons from a fisherman, these interactions with Jesus. Are we pretending Or are we following? Are we pretending? Or are we following? 